If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to the book of First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 29. Uh, while you are turning there, um, I will be flying out of Nashville on Wednesday the 1st and be gone uh, all the way till Saturday for to be with the people of Bibles and Believers Baptist Church uh, up in Idaho. So you pray for traveling mercy and Jared has agreed to take care of the services on Wednesday and uh, Sunday both because I'm afraid I'll be too worn out on Sunday after all that travel. So uh, you pray for Jared, pray that he would be strengthened in the Lord and that uh, he would be given the exact message that uh, we stand in need of. First Chronicles chapter 29, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Uh, I'm sorry, First Chronicles chapter 29, beginning in the very first verse. Uh, the Bible says, Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon, Solomon my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great. For the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God, the gold for the things to be made of gold, and the silver for the things of silver, and the brass for the things of brass, and the iron for the things of iron, and the wood for the things of wood, onyx stones, and stones to be set, glittering stones, and of divers colors, and all manner of precious stones and marble in abundance. Moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God, I have of my own proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of God, over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house, even 3,000 talents of gold, and of gold uh, and of the gold of Ophir, and seven thousand talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the house withal. The gold for the things of gold, and the silver for the things of silver, and all manner of work to be made by the hands of the artificers, who then will be willing to consecrate service this day unto the Lord. Dear Lord, we thank you praise you and we give you great glory and honor just for simply giving us life and breath and peace. God, we pray tonight, uh, we pray this morning that you would meet with your people. God, that you'd come down and you'd fill the house with your presence, that you'd stir us about with your Holy Ghost, and Lord, that you would cause us to uh, look completely in you to this word. God, be us uh, be with us like uh, we've never seen before. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Now we'll be uh, preaching this morning really mostly from the fifth verse. He asked this question, who will come and serve unto the Lord? Who, who's going to help? Who's going to uh, put their part in? Who is going to be the individual that steps up to the plate. Now, we live in a day and age where very, very few people ever get to the point that they actually uh, do what they plan to do. They waste their youthful years in things yeah. that really don't matter, and then when they're old and their energy is spent, they can't do what they want to do. So David asked a very specific question, who is going to build? Who is going to work and in the work of constructing a temple. Now, if you know your Bible, you'll know that David wasn't allowed to because of the sin in his life and the blood that was on his hands, but Solomon, his son, was going to build the temple and going to lead the people following David's death. Now, when he took the throne, Solomon was 12, and he took on the job of a man. Uh, you know what? We've, looked, we've raised a youthful generation today that want to be treated like babies. 
They, they do not want to step up to the plate as Solomon did as a 12-year-old boy and took the throne of Israel. We don't find men like that anymore. You know, on college campuses today, they have quote unquote safe zones. You know, uh, we need, you know why, you know what, when I, I was always small for my age, it's hard to believe now, but I was, and you know what, uh, when somebody picked on me was, was little, I picked up a rock and even the score. Uh, and that we have, they don't have any idea about that anymore. You know what, we need a generation, and you know what, they've been babied to death. They, they don't know how to defend themselves. And, and so we find that uh, we find a young man, a boy really, that took on a man's job. Back in the first verse, the Bible says, Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation. So this morning, the way I understand that, every one of us is responsible. There wasn't one person that wasn't there. There wasn't one thing that, there wasn't one individual that didn't have something to contribute to the cause of the Lord. And that is still true today. The whole congregation was there. And he says, Solomon, Solomon, my son, whom alone God hath chosen. Now, he, uh, he was the very last child that we know of. Uh, you know, David really wanted Absalom to reign. But uh, uh, Absalom was a rebel. Absalom did not want to follow the plan of God. And, and even when he was in, he, he took the majority of the army of Israel and fought against his own father. And yet, and still, when he died, he said, Absalom, Absalom, oh, my son Absalom, would to God that I had died. And so we see that uh, David wasn't going to, going to build the house. Have you ever thought about in your life, Things that, uh, that that you've done that kind of keeps you from serving the Lord like you wished you could. And that, that's very, very common. And, and I'm just giving you an example. And this is, this is by, uh, I believe, a pastor is to be the husband of one wife. And I remember one time, as one thing, me and Brother McCoy always butted heads on and he, he, you know, he had that little beard that came down like this. And he smiled one time, that little beard pushed down, and he said, one at a time. And I said, well, Brother McCoy, the only thing that I can say with that is that's not what the Bible says. And the little, the little thing poked back up. You see, we need to go with what the Bible says in a while. And so then we as the Lord's people, we are held responsible and we are held in, uh, <laughs> we are held to do things for the Lord. Uh, so David says now, I, verse two, now I'm prepared with all my might for the house of my God, the gold for the things made of gold. Now I want you to see, he, he, he makes a statement that many of us can uh, not make. He says, I've prepared with all my might. I've put everything I have in it. I've done the very best I could. You think about even in the week that uh, we completed yesterday and the week that we have lying before us, have you prepared with all your might? Have you studied, studied, studied? I was just talking to Brother Jared about the possibility of having a Bible class in the fall like we did one year with Adam and, and, and just put it out there before the community and see what God might do. And that's preparation. You say, well, that's foolish, Larry. We tried that before. Uh, keep trying. Keep putting things out there. And, and, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, uh, many times we don't try with all our might as David did in preparation of the temple. And then I want you to see that everything has to be appropriate. Now, we live in a day of, day of women preachers just about everywhere you can go. But I want you to see, the Bible says that a, a, a preacher, a pastor, is to be the husband of one wife. Now, how can a woman be the husband of one wife? And so we see that that's an impossibility. Another thing, the Bible says uh, that the women are to keep silent in churches. 
And so how can they preach and be silent at the same thing? Uh, so we find that every, uh, every thing has a place. Every person has a purpose in the service of the Lord. So he says, I have prepared with all my might for the house of God, the gold for the things to be made of gold, very appropriate. You don't prepare gold for the silver portion and silver for the things of silver and brass for the things of brass and iron for the things of iron and wood for the things of wood on its stones to be set glistering stones of divers colors, all manner of precious stones and marble in abundance. Now, you think about this morning, what if they had stopped there? Now, they had some nice, nice stuff. Uh, uh, th this building is nothing that we can really comprehend what the first temple at Jerusalem was. Uh, it, it, it was unbelievable to look upon and probably the most expensive building ever built. But they had all this thing together and they left it lame. Now, this morning, the Lord saved your soul with a purpose. He doesn't save... Just, you know, that's one of the big problems I have with Armenian doctrine. If you can choose God, then you can choose to leave him, and then you could choose not to serve him, right? But God has chosen you to a purpose, and you need to find out what that provisional purpose is and get in it. Get, if you're the gold, get in the things of gold and begin to do it. If you're silver, get in the things of silver and do it. If he's called you to preach, don't preach at it. Preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're to, a teacher, you get in there and you teach, teach, study, teach, study, teach. Whatever he's called you to do, that's your purpose. Verse 3. Moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God. Now, what, what have you set your affection to? Uh, that affection means love, uh, means attention. It, it means devotion. And, and what have you set yourself in that category? Every one of us has a, multiple affections, really. Donna's one of mine. I've set my affection on her many years ago. And because of that, I do certain things, and I don't do other things. You see what I'm saying? That affection, that affection drives me. Um, so what about you? Now, despite uh, it's going to be 32 years of marriage, my affection for the Lord God is to come first. And I think that's as we get older, and even, uh, you know, that's why I believe that the Lord really said it's preferable for a preaching man to remain single. And uh, I think that's why he wrote that, because listen, once you have a wife and you begin having children, listen, your first service is to them. And you have to be sure they have something to eat and some, some clothes to put on and stuff like that. So that takes a little of your attention away from the service of the Almighty. And, and, and so whatever he's given you to do, do it. And do it zealously. Do it. You know, all, if it all it is is to mop the floor, you mop it and you mop, mop so hard that it run, rubs hole in the linoleum. That is how he wants us to serve him. Then I want you to see, after we set our affection to him, after David set his affection on the Lord, he says, I of my own proper good. And so in addition to the national treasury, that's where all those other things came for, he said, I'll give some things of myself. Now, we think about our missionaries, and, you know, we, uh, we give $125 a month to each of our missionaries, and we send them along their way, but what have you given of yourself? I know, and, and I'm sure to say this, we hadn't done it probably in several years, but we just used to send a box to the crafts periodically. You know, uh, a newspaper. You know, you ever thought about not hearing anything from your hometown? ever throw a newspaper in there uh, some truly American food 
a card from the family and send it on its way. Have you ever done that for a missionary? See, that would be out of your own stuff, wouldn't it? That, that would be a lot more personal than, you know, $125 uh, missionary fund New Testament Baptist Church. You see, that what we really do is not giving of ourselves, is it? It's giving of out, of the, uh, out of the church treasury. And, and, and so we see that after David got done with that, he says, I'm going to get something personal. I'm going to make it a, a little harder on me. I'm going to make it a little bit more personal. And he gave out of his own stuff to the things of God. Verse 4, even 3,000 talents of gold and of the gold of Ophir, which was a higher quality, and 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls and the houses with all the gold for the things of gold back to purpose the gold for the things of gold and the silver for the things of silver and for all manner of work to be made by the hands of the artificers now we find what your hands can do now uh, do, you, do you believe these are in, of innate design i believe they are uh, he gives you talents along the way. And uh, uh, I used to be really good at starting IVs, and I still do a pretty good job. But uh, one day they were having trouble to get this man, and I said, well, I'll try it. I don't know. I haven't drawn blood in a long time. And I used a syringe. And there was one of the younger nurses that said, I didn't know you could do that. I was like, well, I remember when that's the only way you did it. And, uh, uh, but I, I got it. And you know what? I would be willing to bet, except maybe for Donna, and I'd say I'm a little bit better than she is, uh, there would have been nobody to be able to stick her. You see, that's a talent that God's given me. And, and wouldn't it be foolish if I walked by that woman and watched six or seven people poke her, knowing that I probably could have got it? But do you not think that we do that every day? That, that whatever talent we have is individual, that we walk by and never do it for the things of the Lord. Whatever that talent might be. You know what? It, it don't have to be what we, call, we would think as amazing. Uh, I can't work on cars. I can start them, put them in gear, and do okay with driving. But my son and Eric, that's the name, like, okay, this is what's wrong with it. This is what we do. That's a gift that I don't have that they do. Don't let me cut your hair. Adam can do that. You see what I'm saying? And, and he give everyone something individual. But of those individual talents, what do you bring before the Lord? What talent do you have hidden or that you're hiding on a routine basis. Singing, preaching, just saying, hey, let, let me interrupt the service and say how good God's been to me. This, this week, you know what? I've eaten every time that I wanted. We had food in abundance. We had the kids out there the other day. And you know what? We took up more food than I could imagine when we were done. See, God will make a way. He will, again and again, the provision of the Almighty. And you know what? We begin to think it's routine, don't we? But I'll tell you what, when the cupboard gets empty, and the next time some food comes around, you know what? You appreciate it a lot more, don't you? Yeah. And, and, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, that whatever position that God's given you, get in it, and serve the Lord. Verse 6. Uh, I'm sorry, the rest of verse 5. And then, and who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? Consecrate means to give, to set aside, to put in the hands of what person is willing to consecrate his service, what he does in this life to the Almighty. Uh, I hope that I would be. But see, it, it's easy when you're pastoring a church that's 10 miles from your house, ain't it? 
What did he say, Larry? The next step is South America. Can't even get there from here. As the old saying goes, I have to go to Nashville and get on a plane. And, 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 and so then things would change, would they not? Would I not begin to grumble and say, hey, I'm 51, nearly 52 years old. What am I doing in a place like that in the middle of a South American jungle? You see what I'm saying? It's okay until it costs you something. And, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, that we, we certainly, if we have a gift, we need to consecrate and say, Lord, I'm willingly giving this to you. This is now yours. It's no longer mine. Verse 6. And the chief of the fathers and the princes of the tribes of Israel and the captains of thousands and of hundreds with the rulers of the king's work offered willingly. Now, I want you to look at these individuals. The chief of the fathers. Now, that, well, who that was was the tribe heads. There was always a tribe head of Joseph and uh, Reuben and uh, all down through that line, 12 tribes of Israel, there was one person that, you know, was the chief dog. And what they were saying is, I'm going to dedicate my tribe to this work. Now, you think about that, fathers. Have you dedicated your tribe to the work of the Almighty? And, and you know that don't happen by accident. You have to say, this is how it's going to be. Listen, fathers, don't you think for a moment you're not going to stand before the Almighty and give an accounting of that family? You know what? Your wife ain't going to give an accounting. You are. And, and, and so we find then to consecrate something to the Lord, to train them to the ministry, to be a true tribe head, you've got to get them down here first. You, you, you've, got to, you've got to educate them in the things of the Bible, and then they're useful unto the things of the Lord. And so uh, that is the Lord's people we need to do. Then he says, and the princes, which was just under the father of the tribe's heads, the captains of thousands and hundreds. And so all these huge people offered willingly their service. Verse 7, and gave for the service of the house of God of gold 5,000 talents and 10,000 grams of silver, 10,000 talents of brass, 18,000 talents, and 100,000 talents of iron. And they with whom precious stones were found gave to them to the treasurer to the treasure of the house of the Lord by the hand of Jehiel the, the Gershonite, and the people rejoiced for they willing uh, for that offered willingly because with a perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. Now you think about that process of offering willingly. Now even in the modern day, tithing is an issue for most people. And let me say this after 32 years of marriage, don't pinch pennies with God. Right. Don't pinch pennies with God. If you're in doubt, always round up. You know, your, your first and second grade teacher taught you not to round up unless it was above five, right? Round up anyway. When it, when it comes to tithing, don't pinch pennies with God. Yeah. So uh, we find then that these individuals, that they came with all this stuff, and it, not only did they give it, they offered it willingly. They were excited about it. So if you're good with tithing, are you excited about giving your service to the Lord? Giving what you have to offer, your time, your energy. You know what? Uh, uh, I just told y'all we may start having a, a, a Bible study for the community. You don't have to come on Tuesday night, but you know what? You ought to come. And I bet in the back of some of your minds, and maybe it's my people, I don't know. Oh, me. Here he goes again. Right? Right? 
hey, is it your time or is it God's time? You know? And, and, and so then as Lord's people, we uh, we ought to have a, zealous, a zealousness to serve him always looking for an improvement in what we do. Verse 10. Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, for our Father forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, thou art exalted as a head above. And so at the end of this, what they were able to do was to praise God more. And I feel like sometimes while our praise is interrupted is that we haven't given God everything in the way that we should. Either we were a little, we were a little grumbly about it, or maybe we just kept back something. You know, I, 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 I ain't good at that. I really don't have a talent for that, so I ain't going to do it. Well, listen, I don't think in any way you, you saw all the things they had saved for the house of the Lord and the gold for the things of gold. It was very ordered. And there's not one saved person that don't have some purpose in the, in, in the church of the Lord God. If it's nothing else but keeping a pew warm, that's purpose. And God will use that uh, in a great and a mighty way. So then as the Lord's people, we need to find that. And I'm going to read you one that never got satisfied. He was always looking for something new. Uh, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9. And we're going to be spotty because of time's sake, but... Uh, you know the scriptures well. Acts chapter 9 and verse 8. Acts chapter 9 and verse 8. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him unto Damascus. Now, I want you to see it was after the Lord struck him on the road to Damascus and he was blind. When I take these glasses off, I don't do very well. Uh, if I didn't know where you are or were sitting, I probably couldn't recognize anybody. And when I put these on, I'm just as clear as a bell. But Paul was even more blind than that. You, you know what we need to do? Sometimes it's turn off the phones, turn off the TV, and uh, get in a place by yourself and just sit there. Become blind to the world. See, e e even the things that is happening right now in our country with corona and, and these racial violences and, and all that stuff, you know what that is? It's to deter you from serving the Almighty. That's all that is. Uh, in your own family. You know what? The turmoil I had, I heard some not so good news about one of my nieces yesterday. And you know what? I could really sit and brood over that or I could commit it to God in prayer and move on. I, I really have a choice. And you know what? I know a lot of people that would simply brood about it and then they turn around and call it prayer, right? And that is not for us to do. And, and so we find then that the Lord's people should be blinded at least for a little while to the things of this world. Uh, now drop down to verse 17 with me. Uh, Acts 9 verse 17. And, and Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, hath appeared unto thee in the way that thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. 
Now, I want you to see two things there. The first thing is this, that he was going to relieve him, and he was going to be able to see the world again. You know what? I dare say after you went blind, you'd see the world in a brand new way, would you not? If you could not see for three days and it opened up, it looked like a brand new place for you. And so we find Ananias comes and says, Brother Saul, and prays for his vision to be restored, and more than that, filled with the Holy Ghost. You know what? There's no scriptural interpretation there except this. You know what it means? Being filled with the Holy Ghost. And, and so we find then that uh, Paul was in a situation now that he could serve the Lord. He could serve him fully. You know what? Sometimes these little meandering creatures that, you know, never seem really to me to be excited about the goodness of God and, and have no zeal in their preaching and, and apparently no burden for the lost, you know what? I wonder about it. Because, see, that at least to me, they're not, they're, they're not, they don't have a ministry like in Paul, do they? And, and, and so we find then that uh, Paul has a brand new a brand new look on things after this experience. Verse 18, and immediately there fell from his eyes or as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Now I want you to see, and uh, the Lord's showing me this more and more as time goes by, baptism was immediate. And I'm not saying more salvation, but I'll say this. I think Baptist, that this thing of putting somebody and looking at them a while, it's just not scriptural. You've seen churches do that? Give them six months, see how things go? It's, it's not in the Bible. You do it if you want to, but you're going against scripture. And, and, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, that uh, this was a brand new start for Paul. This was a brand new uh, time in his life, and I want you to see how it fell out. Uh, reading on uh, from 17, verse 18, And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith. He arose and was baptized, and when he had received meat, he was strengthened, then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. Now, I want you to see this church at Damascus uh, needed to instruct him in some things, didn't he? Uh, listen, we don't need to send people out that don't know what they're preaching. It's wonderful to see young men called to preach, but you know what? They need some time of training, don't they? And so, Paul or Saul at this point, who would be Paul, he spent some time with the church there at Damascus and was educated. Verse 20, in straight way, he preached Christ in the synagogues and he, that he is the son of God. And so he preached the gospel fully to them. I want you also to notice that he did it with boldness and he didn't take 50 years to do it. You ever keep putting off something? Um, just a different thing. Me and Donna have a mower in our yard, and it sank in the mud one time. That's how old it is. And I use my tractor to pull it up out of the mud, and it's on its way down again. And we have talked about taking that to the dump. I know for 10 years. And you know what? He's still sitting at the house. Uh, what do you think Paul would have done with that mower? If the Lord let him get rid of it, I believe he's done been in a dump, don't you? But hesitance, and you know, and me and Donna had an argument about this the other day, and I said, Donna, I'll just use the tractor, and I'll pull, it, I'll pull it up into the truck, and when I get to the landfill, I'll be able to push it out. And she says, no, you won't. And you know what? Probably she's right. And uh, you know what? Again, the tractor's still sitting, I mean, the mower's still sitting there. And we probably be talking about it a uh, a long, long time, and still not get the job done. But you know what? We don't have to be that way in the Lord's work. Paul went immediately into the center of the Jews there and preached unto them Christ. 
And, and, and he didn't wait. He, he, he was quick. And, and he, uh, he got the job done. And this would be the ministry and obedience unto God. Verse 22, but Saul increased the more in strength. In other words, his learning, his boldness, and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that, many days were fulfilled. The Jews took counsel to kill him. And after, but their laying away was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. And the disciples took him by night and laid him down by the wall in a basket. And I, so I want you to see, this is the first documented trial of Paul. Um, Anytime you preach, anytime you serve the Lord zealously, whatever your role is, it's going to make somebody mad. Yeah, you know, I haven't seen it that much, and I don't know if I've seen it any in this church, but I've been to other churches, and especially when I was a kid. You know, used to they had dinner on the ground, and there'd be long tables, and uh, outside in August, just sweating, and it'd be all kinds of food. Over at Carlisle, the best one was the little Free Will Baptist Church there. But then they had everything. And uh, I heard him a woman, well, she brought the, lab, the same pie last year. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, it was baked beans, but they wasn't real good baked beans. You know, just criticizing one another. And, 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 and so we find that it's very easy to get into that. And so what Paul was preaching was true, and it was making other people mad. Instead of rejoicing with him, it was upsetting him. To the point he was let down by a basket. That was his only escape. He couldn't even leave the city through one of the gates because they were watching him. But you know what? When he got down, he didn't run like a scalded dog. He went to his next preaching point. And that's the difference. That's the difference. And, and so we, we see then, as the Lord's people, if, if one door slams shut, and uh, give a good example, Jared, that mess over at Paris, it slams shut on you, you did the right thing, but I'll guarantee you this, the door's open somewhere because of the goodness of God, because he didn't call you to preach, to sit around. And you know what? He didn't save you simply to do nothing. He doesn't work that way. And so, what did Paul do next? Uh, 13, in the very first verse. Uh, 13, in the very first verse, and there was in the church, which was at Antioch, so he went from Damascus and Antioch, and I want you to see, the Bible's very clear, all these churches were already in existence. And there wasn't a church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and preachers, as Bar Barnabas, and Simon, uh, or Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Mananon, which had been brought up with Herod, and the Terarch, and Saul. So this is the church where he landed in. Uh, verse 2, and they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Now, we find a very unassuming thing. He went from preaching boldly and being thrown out of the city for it, to simply fasting, praying and fasting. You know, uh, you think that would be like kind of a letdown after preaching that way? Man, I was, I, I was firing it up over there in Damascus, and now I'm here just praying. You know what? I don't think Paul thought that way, do you? I really don't. He was fasting and praying at Antioch. I know, you know, he was uh, praying for strength. And, but the Bible says here that they were just seeking the, word, uh, the will of the Lord. And then the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work and two that I have called them. And then he was back on the road. You see, um, you may get a little breather every once in a while. But what that breather is about is praying and fasting and seeking the face of God every time. And, and so we find that uh, that Paul was 
uh, was in there and he was interested and nothing was too small and nothing was too big for what uh, what he was willing to do uh, for the Lord. Now, if you will, uh, drop down uh, to 42 in this same chapter. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And so I want you to notice that the Jews didn't want to hear nothing about Jesus, but the Gentiles said, we want more of this. We want to hear this more. Probably one of the beginnings of Paul switching from the Jewish people to the Gentile believers was in this instance. He was looking for a place to preach, and he didn't care where it would be. Uh, Acts 14, verse 19. Acts 14 and verse 19. And they came thither certain Jews from Antioch and from Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing that he'd been dead. Now, all this time in this chapter, he had been preaching the kingdom of God. He had been preaching salvation by grace. He had been preaching, preaching. The Jews were mad at him. And you know what that means where it says stoned him? Uh, it means they stoned him. That means they threw big rocks at him, knocked him out to the point they thought he was dead. And I've often wondered, was this the time that he was caught up into the third heaven? Uh, I don't know. Uh, could have been. And because he looked dead. And then it says he rose up and went on his way. And for the rest of his life, it was just that way. Shipwreck, stonings, beatings and finally he says now I'm ready to be offered now and the time of my departure is at hand yeah. he, he, he knew the end he was almost there to the end but you know what he did not give up even when he was in prison locked up those letters those things we hold precious today is the inspired word of God all the church letters was written out of a prison cell mm -hmm. see we don't need to give up. We just need to find whatever. And when the door closes, listen, uh, I may be wrong, but I think the door's closing on, on those booths that we've set up for 10 years because of corona. I really will say it's because of an infringement of our freedom of speech. But um, that, 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 <laughs> this is how it's being worked out. You know what we do? Just like Paul, fast and pray, find what the next thing to do is. That, that's all we're given to do, is it not? So I asked you this morning, how close, how attuned into you are you to the Lord's will specifically for your life? You individual, whatever gift he's given you, whatever thing he's set, set in your heart to do, are you doing it? And are you doing it well? You know, that, that's the other thing. Uh, don't halfway do something. If you're going to do it, do it right. Put everything you got into it. And uh, then move on to the next thing. This morning, whatever your need is,